Well, the marketing group's an acquisition vehicle with the aim of pulling together successful marketing businesses under one roof. They're a UK-based company made up of a number of independent marketing teams. Each of them have their own specific expertise and services. And earlier this year, they began trading on the NASDAQ First North Stockholm market. Very pleased to have Chairman Jeremy Harbour in the studio with me. Jeremy, really good to meet you. Hi. Firstly, just nail it down in a little bit more detail for us what exactly you do. Yeah, so uh, fundamentally, the marketing group is a collaborative uh, IPO, a collaborative group of entrepreneurs who've got together to uh, to list their company. And this is quite different to a traditional uh, roll-up uh, structure. Um, the, the marketing industry is very fragmented. You have five or six very big players. There's probably 200 mid-sized players. And then there are tens of thousands of kind of small to medium-sized companies that, that make up the rest. Um, we felt that if you could take the top 1% of those tens of thousands of small to medium sized companies, the companies that are well established, that are profitable, that are debt free, that are run by kind of leaders in their field, and put them together and give them the scale and liquidity of a, of a public listed company, um, that they could really compete with some of the largest companies in the world. And that's exactly what we, we did. So we put uh, an initial group of four companies together, and we've now grown to 19 companies all listed on the NASDAQ First North. So you've got 19 companies at the moment. Yeah. In terms of staff, how many mm -hmm. people have you got on the books now? Uh, that's around 520 staff globally. So there's operations from New Zealand, Australia, Singapore, Lithuania, uh, UK, and over in, uh, in the US as well, East and West Coast. So marketing, it's an incredibly competitive industry, would you agree? Yes, absolutely. How, how is what you're doing separate you from the rest? Yeah, so I think um, in, in every sector of marketing services, it's quite a broad, quite a broad area. In every se sector of marketing services, you always find there are leaders in those fields. So people that are excelling in their particular uh, space, but often they don't get the, uh, the, the full kind of bite of the cherry. They, get, um, uh, they can pitch for some of the bigger contracts, but invariably they're too small. They don't have the scale. I call it the scale paradox. You have to be big to get big. Mm -hmm. um, so they're not able to win those, uh, those really big contracts. Um, and yet often the larger agencies are winning those contracts and then getting these guys to deliver it because they, they're the real expertise in that particular area, whether it's an area of digital marketing or content creation or, or something like that. So we really wanted to get those businesses together um, because collectively under one balance sheet and profit and loss, they can then point to the, uh, point to the bigger uh, picture and, and have the scale to be able to compete on a, on a level playing field with some of those bigger players. Well, it's certainly a great idea. Are there others out there doing well, the so same? The, the traditional approach in marketing is to do the roll-up, um, mm -hmm. which is where you know it's an acquisition model buying lots of companies. The roll-ups are invariably flawed for a number of reasons. They're either debt-fueled, so you end up with this huge mountain of debt that you're uh, running around with. We're debt-free. Um, or they're ego fueled, so they're obsessed with changing the sign above the door and creating a brand. Um, whereas, in fact, these companies have often spent decades building fantastic brands and cultures and reputations within their uh, within their client base. Um, uh, or they're so focused on this centralization idea. I think um, when you only look at business through a spreadsheet, it can be very easy to think that centralizing everything uh, makes it more efficient. But I'm a big believer that actually decentralized things are more efficient. If you look at the average small to medium sized enterprise, they would never dream of having an administrative member of staff on a six figure salary. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you look at any global company, they have offices filled with people on six figure salaries doing administrative uh, uh, work. So I think if you have um, entrepreneurs who are focused on delivering profit and it's their, their personal wealth is linked to that profit production, they're going to run the most efficient uh, way that they can. And if they can collaborate to create further efficiencies, then they do. And that's the best way to get synergies through collaboration, not forced from, from the top down. Well, look, you, you've mentioned the kind of companies that you look for when acquiring. Mm -hmm. Are you able to go into any more detail and tell us exactly who you're working with at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the, the basic idea is to have companies who are leaders in their field. So um, these are people that have either won awards or written books about the, the area of marketing services that they're involved in or regularly on the speaker circuit around their particular topics. 
Um, uh, those companies have to be well established, they have to be profitable and have a history of generating um, uh, profits, and they have to be debt free. And the debt free one normally surprises people, but the, the idea behind that is basically that nobody else has a lien or a charge over the assets of that company. That creates a level playing field um, for all of the participants in the group, that if one of the companies has a bad year, it's just a bad year, it's not their last year. You know, if the bank pulls mm -hmm. the plug, it's their last year. So, um, uh, so the idea is it creates a very robust level playing field for everybody to uh, to operate in. Um, I'm fortunate that my background in, uh, in private equity, I also teach people how to buy and sell companies. I'm a lecturer around the world on that, mm -hmm. on that topic. It means that I have a huge number of people around the world referring deals to us. So we really have the pick of the bunch when it comes to the types of companies that could come and join us. One of the flaws in a traditional roll-up is always deal flow. People don't have enough deals to look at. We've pitched over a thousand companies, the, the marketing group uh, methodology, and we have a, around a hundred companies due, going through due diligence right now. So um, we have incredible deal flow um, uh, to, to be able to grow this group. And exciting times ahead by the sounds of it. Absolutely, yeah. Well, look, as I mentioned earlier, you're listed on the uh, NASDAQ First North Stockholm market, but yep. you're a UK-based company. Yeah. Uh, what was the attraction of listing on that? Yeah, so we're, we're a global company, so we're headquartered in the UK. And one of the reasons for being a UK uh, headquartered company was that we do have uh, businesses in the US and businesses in uh, Asia. And the UK has a very good transparent uh, um, regime for operating your business, um, very robust financial reporting standards, which create trust for uh, for investors and, uh, and all of that stuff. And also um, there's no withholding taxes for investment here. So if you're an American company and, you, and somebody invests from outside the US, you have withholding taxes on your investment. And likewise in, in Asia. So, so the UK was uh, considered the best place for the holding uh, company, despite the fact the assets are spread all around the world. Um, however, the UK from a currency perspective and from a market liquidity perspective wasn't the best place for us to list. So we reviewed all of the exchanges around the world and looked at where would be most suitable from a currency and liquidity perspective. And the NASDAQ First North comes up as, uh, uh, as the best one for that. We were able to list in euros, second most traded currency in the world. Um, and also we have fantastic liquidity. We've had days where we've done uh, 4 million euros in a day um, of, of share trading, which is um, you know, the, the same as some main market listed companies in other, in other parts of the world. And it's hugely popular with retail investors as well. It is, yeah. So the Nordic region has more um, uh, share ownership per capita than anywhere else in the world. So from a start, there's a very uh, strong base and they have a real um, uh, passion and interest in uh, small cap stocks. Now, obviously, we're only small cap at the beginning of our journey. Journey, um, and that's very important because the way the NASDAQ um, First North is structured is you join at the, on the bottom of the ladder and you move up to the main market. And it's the same exchange, it's the same ticker. So if you list on a normal secondary exchange, you have to relist if you want to go to a main market. So on the main NASDAQ market, you've got AstraZeneca with 50 billion of market cap, Volvo, H&M, the second largest retailer in the world. Um, these companies are all sitting on, on the NASDAQ main market. So it's very easy for us to progress from there. And a nice fit for you. Absolutely, yeah, and fits our model of, of growing quickly. It'll be interesting to know just how easy is it to trade on the NASDAQ? Yeah, I mean, uh, virtually every broker can, uh, has the capability to trade uh, shares on the First North, you know, on behalf of their clients, whether their clients are um, individuals, high net worth individuals, private clients, um, institutions. Um, yeah, it's very straightforward. Well, look, going going forward, what are the what are the big plans? What's the focus for you? Um, yeah, uh, uh, right now we've grown uh, in the first uh, sort of 120 days since we listed. We've grown from four companies to 19 companies, from a projected one and a half million of EBIT this year to a projected 12 million of EBIT. Uh, this year um, from about 40 staff to about 520 staff. So the, the growth curve so far has been um, uh, exponential, um, but it really is just the start. So as I mentioned, we're due diligencing over 100 companies. We've got um, uh, uh, an almost limitless pipeline of businesses that Absolutely. we think could join this kind of model. And because we um, uh, don't take operational control or centralize <coughs> all of the functions, we don't suffer from the normal indigestion you get from an, from an acquisition strategy. You know, normally every time you acquire a company, you spend six months screwing it up, frankly, which is you know, trying to jam their culture into your culture, trying to integrate their accounts team with your accounts team and, and all the rest. Because we don't do that, we don't get the same indigestion. We believe that the value is created through the scale and the liquidity that our, uh, our vehicle creates. So therefore, the synergies can be found more naturally between the entrepreneurs. They can, they can talk to each other. 
So we recently had a summit in Singapore uh, for the Formula One. Uh, we got all uh, the time, it was only 17 business owners, there's now 19. Um, but the 17 of them all came together in one place and it was really fascinating. Lots of things were agreed and they, they designed the, the, the way forward for the business. But one of the interesting parts was that um, instead of having a centralized function for things, which is the natural go-to uh, idea that most uh, private equity firms come up with for a, for a roll-up, is actually we've linked between all of the companies the different functions. So we have the CEOs all together because that was the, the meeting, mm -hmm. but they've also put all of the business development guys together. So um, you know they're all commissioned based so they're really going to find how they can work with each other's clients we then put all of the operations people together well they're really focused on how you can make things more efficient uh, when you have several companies in different uh, countries and some companies in the same countries and then you put all the finance people together and they can really work how you can reduce costs how you can use group deals for things like insurance and and, and things like that so that they can rinse out every last uh, last dollar so the opportunity for the kind of collaboration and synergies to go forwards is all being driven by the business owners instead of being driven from the top down and when it's done like that you don't upset the talent and then you don't mm -hmm. upset the clients and everything just works much much better look huge opportunity uh, lots of exciting acquisitions in the pipeline mm -hmm. In terms of your, your listing on the NASDAQ, was that to raise cash in order to, to assist in, the, in these acquisitions? Uh, no, it wasn't. So all of the acquisitions are done using stock. Um, and uh, when we listed, we only did an offering of about 1.25 million. It was very small. And the only reason we did that was for liquidity. We needed a retail market that would trade our, would trade our shares. Um, so I think too many people list to either exit or to mm -hmm. raise capital and I think actually capital markets aren't the best place for raising money and I don't think they're necessarily the best place for an exit either. Um, what they are fantastic for is creating a vehicle for acquisition. Um, but then I'm an M&A guy, so everything I think about is either mm -hmm. a merger or, or acquisition related. So really good to speak to you, really good Thank to meet you. you Jeremy, appreciate you coming in. Excellent. Thank you very much.